ever heard that humans and chimps shared common ancestry, that we share some 95 and 99% of the genome? Well, let's, let's delve into this a little bit more here. So there's this principles of taxonomy, which is kind of stating big fancy words, taxonomy being uh, the organization of life, that there's three basic domains of life. There's the bacteria, the archaea, and the eukarya. The bacteria and the archaea we refer to as prokaryotes because they don't have a true nucleus, and the eukaryotes have a true nucleus. The bacteria and archaea, there's some minor differences, and you can take a course in microbiology, we can talk about that some more. Uh, but part of that theory says that the way that we came up with the eukaryotes because they have a nucleus, is that there was once this ancient archaean cell that engulfed a bacteria that was free living, like a mitochondria or a chloroplast, and so they ended up with this symbiotic relationship, and so that's how we came up to exist over millions and billions of years. Okay, let's just forget that there's no actual fossil evidence of this ever happening, but let's just, let's just say it happened. This guy, uh, Doolittle, uh, has done a lot of research investigating uh, the, the tree of life from a bacterial perspective, the three domains, and he's organized. And you get the standard idea of a tree where it has everything with a common base, uh, sharing common ancestry, and we see all the different lineages coming forward today, and you see evidence of the endosymbiotic theory coming in on the side here. And this is supposed to demonstrate for you, aha, we're right. But let's not tell you what the real evidence is. Well, what's the real evidence? Well, the real evidence actually looks more like this, where you see all the everything going all over every which way, and you're like, what does that mean? Well, what they've had to do is invoke this concept called horizontal gene transfer. To help you understand horizontal gene transfer, it's, the, it's not quite the same as vertical gene transfer. So vertical gene transfer is parents having kids that have kids. That's vertical gene transmission. Horizontal gene transmission would be like the brother and sister exchanging genes. Or like me giving you my genes. And I'm not talking about my pants that I'm wearing. I'm talking about the genetic material, the DNA, has to go from one organism to the next. Now... I'm not going to deny it, horizontal gene transfer happens. That's how we get the emerging antibiotic resistance in bacteria. I've got a PhD in microbiology. I'm well aware of that. But what I'm saying is when you're exchanging genes, it never involves stuff like the ribosomal RNA subunit. Uh, and, and that's how the, the tree of life was, was put together, was based on sequencing this, this one gene. Okay, so what happens then, it, let's simplify this crazy picture of everything going every which way, and let's just take all the, horse, the vertical gene transfer and just represent it by a simple line vertical like this, and we'll have the horizontal gene transfer as a horizontal line like this. Now, if you watch closely with me, how can you tell the difference between this figure and this one? I can't tell the difference. You see, what happens when you invoke horizontal gene transfer, it undercuts that common ancestor, that last universal common ancestor. You can't figure out what it was because horizontal gene transfer just uproots the tree of life at its, at its base. So what have evolutionists done to fix this problem? Well, they said instead of having one origin of life, which, I mean, it's crazy astronomical odds, there's more com different combinations to put together the first simple cell than there are hydrogen atoms in the universe. So this is like giving you a, a puzzle box with 200 pieces inside of the puzzle and then asking you to open it the first time and having it completely organized the right way the first time you open it. Oh, and by the way, you die if you don't do it. All right, so those crazy odds right there in and of themselves. But then they go one step further, and, and to explain this horizontal gene transfer thing, they say, okay, well, maybe uh, maybe there were multiple origins of life. Yeah? So instead of astronomical odds one time, let's multiply the astronomical odds one on top of the other. I mean, that's just nuts. So how do they tell what, the, how can you tell whether you've got two similar genes or not? This number, this percentages of uh, 95 to 98%. Well, you can see here, let's give you this hypothetical situation where we've got two species and we've got their two different sequences. And you can see there in the areas that are highlighted blue, that's where there is a difference. And the areas where there's a vertical line between the species one and species two, that means there's 100% identity, a similarity is exact in those spots. 
The other places are what we call non-identities. So with this eight, example that I've got of 18 up here at the top, we get a match of 9 out of 18 if we just take um, bookends and, and we just take it straight as is. But what um, people sequencing genomes will often do is they will take those sequences between species 1 and species 2 and they will uh, insert gaps that are highlighted in green in the sequences and spread it out. So instead of having 18 sequences, they add some gaps and they get up to 20 uh, nucleotides for the comparison. And then what they do afterwards is they can switch where the non-identities go so that they can minimize the non-identity to only one. And in doing so, what happens then is that you've got these gaps where there is no DNA, but they say that there must be some DNA because all the rest of it lines up perfectly. Well, not perfectly, but you can see you go from the first situation of having 9 out of 18 to then after doing this alignment that you end up with having 15 out of 20. That's a 50% identity that was changed into a 75% identity. They say, oh, well, we didn't change the numbers. Uh, or the, the, the sequence or the data, but they massaged it so that they got a better answer and they get a higher percentage. They do this all the time. Trust me, I have sequenced E. coli genome. I have worked with people that have worked on the sequencing of the human genome. So I know what the, the tricks of the trade are. I'm not saying they're tricky. I'm just saying this is the tools that they use. And this is how they come up with the idea that we are 95% similar to chimpanzees. And so that's among the DNA that's similar. That's not among the DNA that has no similarity whatsoever. So you hear those numbers and it's just, I, I don't know what to do with them. And yet they're gonna tell us, we share common ancestry with chimpanzees. There's a shared common ancestor. Oh, how do we know that? I'm, I'm sorry, you know, uh, how do we know they're a common ancestor? Oh, well, we know that they're a common ancestor because they've got homologous structures. Oh, yeah, what's a homologous structure? Oh, well, we know it's a homologous structure because they share a common ancestry. Wait, wait, wait a second. You're, you're telling me that we, we know it's a homologous structure because of common ancestry. So, just tell me again, what's common ancestry? Oh, well, we know it's a common ancestor because they share homologous structures. And on and on, around the circle we go. Now, there's a point to um, circular thinking, okay, and logic. It, it, it makes really terrific logic, but you can't prove them wrong because by definition, uh, homologous structures are, share common ancestry. You need to have some independent validation of this kind of a concept. And so people are sequencing DNA, trying to show common ancestry, sequencing genomes, sequencing uh, 16S ribosomal RNA subunits. And this is the, the way by which we define what E. coli is. We get this, we sequence the 16S ribosomal subunit of the RNA for the ribosome. And we're able to say, aha, this is E. coli. Now I know a thing or two about E. coli. I've done a lot of work with E. coli. There's good E. coli and bad E. coli. Please don't think that all E. coli are bad. There's some good ones. They live with you. You take them with you everywhere you go. And you want to keep the good and stay away from the bad. So they started sequencing these genomes and they started comparing them among each other. They sequenced the good E. coli first and then they sequenced the hamburger pathogen and a urinary tract pathogen. And they found out that those three strains of E. coli share only 39.2% similarity. So, so let's apply this logic then to human evolution. And if we are supposed to have 95 to 98 percent similarity with chimps, that means one of two situations. Either humans have evolved crazy fast, or that you really can't trust those numbers in making these comparisons based off of percentages. So they went through and they've sequenced the E. coli genomes now. They've not only sequenced the commensal MG1655 and the EDL933, they share 66% in common. And then they did the, the urinary tract pathogen that went down to 39.2. They have now sequenced up to as many as 17 different E. coli genome sequences. I can't even put those all on one kind of screen for you to show you. And what they found with the 17 different E. coli genomes is that they only share some 2,200 genes in common. That doesn't even describe everything that's different between all of them. So what's E. coli? Yeah, that's pretty amazing. They sequenced 17 and there is not two identical E. coli genomes to date. That's remarkable. And, and so then they want to say that, again, just to remind you, that the chimps and humans share 95, 97. 
percent similarity, yet we can't even define what E. coli is. Now, I'm not worried, okay? I'm not saying that we should just throw out all the E. coli research. Please, no. I love doing E. coli research. Fascinating. It's, it's a great organism to study. But what I'm saying is we're making the wrong comparisons with what the data says. And only until recently have we started to see this among the evolutionists themselves, people like Michael Lynch at Indiana University, saying that clarification of the phylogenetic relationships has been an elusive problem. Finally, somebody honest saying that these phylogenetic relationships, how we can build these trees of life, that's what this phylogenetic relationships means. We can't build uh, any kind of a uh, clear picture. We can't get the single answer that evolutionists demand because of common ancestry. And so finally, people like Carl Woese, the guy who came up with the whole idea of the 16S ribosomal RNA subunit, says that no consistent organismal phylogeny has emerged from the many individual protein phylogenies so far produced. What that means is you can pick any gene you want and we can build a different tree of life. Not the same one, different, many, many different ones. So that means then the evolutionist has a problem because they say there is a parent design with common ancestry. Well, I look at their argument and I don't see any common ancestry. The apparent design is actually a parent ancestry with a common design. We look into the scriptures and we can see that very clearly. So, back in the early 70s, this guy, Theodosis Dobzhansky, said, nothing in biology makes sense except in light of evolution. And people have had fun with this, and they try to make fun of it, like saying, nothing in biology makes sense. No, 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 don't do that. So people like Michael Lynch, we talked about previously, he took Dobzhansky's to the next level, and he said, nothing in evolution makes sense except in light of population genetics. And that makes a world of sense from his worldview. I get it. That makes sense. But what I don't get is why all the creationists have yet to say nothing in biology makes sense except in light of scripture. The only way that we can understand completely what the evidence says about common ancestry is to turn to the Bible and understand in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth and he made this after its kind, to reproduce after its kind, made this after its kind, after its kind, after its kind. And behold, it was very good.